Welcome to What is Going Om for new thought from the edge of Om. Each week on Om Times flagship radio show, veteran broadcaster, author, and media consultant Sandy Sedgebeer conducts thought provoking interviews with inspirational authors, artists, musicians, scientists, speakers, and filmmakers who are working at the point where spirituality and science meet consciousness at the very edge of Om. Here is your host, Sandy Sedgebeer. Hello. We've all heard stories of spontaneous healings, radical remissions, and miracle recoveries from incurable cancers. But in truth, how many of us understand enough about the actual mechanics of miracles to believe that one could happen for us? Joseph Selby is a dedicated queer meditation and yoga teacher and international speaker and conference leader. He's helped hundreds of people awaken to their own spiritual potentials. A polymath and author whose books include The Physics of God, Break Through the Limits of the Brain, Joseph Selby joins me today to discuss his latest book, The Physics of Miraculous Healing, How Emotion, Mind and Spirit Enable Unlimited Self-Healing, which not only presents solid evidence from the frontiers of modern physics to support that no condition or disease is incurable, but also shares tried and tested practices and techniques to help you access your own potential for rapid and miraculous self-healing. Joseph Selby, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me back. Pleasure to be here. Always a pleasure to speak with you, Joseph. So, no disease or condition is incurable. Many would say that's a really bold statement to make, but you say there is solid evidence. Tell us about that. There is an amazing amount of evidence that not only is it possible, but people uh, in the hundreds, maybe even in the thousands every year are healing from what's considered terminal cancer. And there are uh, verified, scientifically verified experiences of people having extraordinarily rapid healing. So one of my favorite stories is about a woman named Barbara Kumiski. And this story occurred in the 60s, I believe, perhaps the 70s. And Barbara, when she was 16, was diagnosed with uh, multiple sclerosis. And for the next uh, 16 years, she gradually declined uh, to the point where when this story was told, she was unable to walk unaided. She needed to be in a wheelchair. She needed oxygen. Uh, she had lost tremendous amount of weight. She was unable to use her hands. Her hands had actually curled in towards her forearms, so she couldn't really use them. Same with her feet. And while being visited by friends, just in the middle of a conversation, she heard a voice that said, get up and walk. And she did. She stood up, and as she stood up, her hands uncurled, the weight that she had lost returned, her feet resumed their normal position. She was able to uh, walk unaided into the living room of her parents' home. And literally within minutes, she was completely not only healed, but restored to health. Uh, restored to her normal uh, <clears throat> body functions. The next day, she saw her doctor who had consulted with her for now almost 20 years. And he said, there is no sign at all of multiple sclerosis anywhere in your body at this point. Now, it's very interesting that what goes with this is her description of what she experienced, and particularly what she had been experiencing for a while, was that even though she couldn't be serviceful to people, she couldn't be helpful, she couldn't be, as she put it, uh, functioning in the world as most people do, 
she had found her way to be of service to people, to be what she called a contributing member of the human race by praying for people. And she spent hours every day praying for people in need, uh, uh, for various needs, you know, health, uh, problems in their lives, not enough money, all the things that you would expect people to ask for help with in a prayerful way. And she was so deep into it that she felt completely um, at peace with who she was, what her role in life was. Mm -hmm. She didn't feel like she was a victim or suffering in any way because she had found this way to serve and to feel that sense of service. And she attributes that sort of state of awareness, that sort of state of consciousness to being what drew this tremendous grace that healed her. So there's a lot of things we can unpack in that story, but one of them certainly is that she healed far, far more rapidly than modern medicine can account for. And that uh, not only was it rapid, but it was uh, recovery from a disease that's generally considered to be eventually fatal. Mm. So there are other stories that I have encountered, and mm. as you know, I can share more with you. But if something like that can happen even once, and it happens far more often than once, in fact, but if it can happen even once, yes. We should try to understand how it could possibly have happened, right? Yeah. And so modern medicine doesn't have an answer. No. Because mm -hmm. modern medicine is based on science that is, ironically, perhaps for this, what we consider to be this leading edge, cutting edge science, it's relying on fundamental principles that are over 100 years out of date. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they they spend more time trying to disprove than uh -huh. trying to prove. I mean, you know, it's interesting, this particular story that you've just shared, when you compare it to Anita Mojani's story, where she, she was somebody who lived in fear, you know, she wasn't at home with herself because she had so much fear in her life. Um, she also had complete healing after her near-death experience when she left her body and spoke to her father and the right. doctors immediately didn't believe it either yes because it just doesn't fit their model they they literally don't think it's possible yeah. so when it happens they look for any any other explanation they can and typically it's um put down to misdiagnosis yes that yeah. The person really didn't have that condition, even though everybody, all the doctors thought they did. Uh, and so they were able to have this rapid healing because they were suffering from something else. Yeah. But there are so many instances where there's just no question the diagnosis was originally accurate and that their healing was remarkable nonetheless, mm -hmm. that you really have to, you have to question it. What made you want to write a book about this? Well, I've always been fascinated by the kind of intersection of science and spirituality. And uh, a big aspect of spirituality is tapping into more subtle powers, to tapping into more subtle abilities to uh, keep ourselves healthy or to heal ourselves when we're ill. And so I wanted to see whether I could find the science that would explain how these things are happening, because they're obviously happening. And I think the more people who can be uh, open to this deeper way of healing, this deeper way of staying healthy, uh, the better. So. If it takes understanding another kind of, another level of science in order for people to be open to it, then 
I think that's a, you know, a needed mm. service right now, a needed step for people to be able to take. And my mind just kind of works with this combination of science and spirituality because I've always been science oriented, but I also have been a meditator for 50 years and yeah. have taught yeah. experiential spirituality. So the two just uh, work together in my mind just all the time. I'm always thinking about when I read a, an article about some new breakthrough, I think, oh, well, how does that fit with a, yeah. another and complementary picture of reality that we get from spiritual teachers? And as you make clear in the book, modern physics, um, not modern medicine, can explain extraordinary healing. Yes, and modern physics really sort of was just a continuation of the kind of line of discovery, the steps of discovery that originally ushered in very important principles for modern medicine, the essentially classical physics and how atoms and molecules work and interact with each other. All that is real and important, but that's where modern medicine stopped. But modern physics kept going and modern physics kept going into relativity with Einstein's um, famous equation e equals mc squared. The underlying glimpse that gives us into the nature of reality is there is no such thing as matter. There really is no such thing as atoms and molecules. Atoms and molecules are energies moving in stable patterns that interact with each other. So this is the first glimpse we get that we might be a lot more mutable than we tend to think because modern science tends to think that atoms and molecules, short of a nuclear explosion uh, will remain exactly as they are. They will remain as these fixed uh, objects. But already we have that door opening through relativity that we too are made of energy. And then quantum physics came along with a mind bending next step uh, that is that not only is matter essentially energy, there are times when the energy in matter behaves as waves of energy, formless waves of energy, and then it can revert back to behaving like atoms and molecules. And this is known as the wave particle duality. Mm. And that this uh, Jekyll Hyde transformation happens all the time. So not only are we made of energy, but it could be quite possible. In fact, I believe it's most of the time. The energies that make up our physical body are behaving like waves. So they're even more mutable because they are formless when they're behaving as waves. And this is what really puts the, you know, the weird into quantum weirdness is this notion that matter has this dual nature that it goes back and forth between being wave-like and being uh, stable patterns of energy. Then there's another step out that uh, physics took, which is also confounding to kind of our more material look at the world around us which is that when the energies that make up our body or anything for that matter, but when the energies that make up our body behave like waves of energy, it actually disappears from the physical universe and is only present in what's called non-locality, another realm. And the two realms are uh, interpenetratingly connected, but they obey different laws. So this other realm, often known as non-locality, uh, is where we get things like entanglement, that objects, no matter how far apart they might be in the universe, can be 
uh, entangled and the affecting one instantly affects the other, no matter how far apart they are. And this doesn't make sense uh, in the, in the, through the lens of local laws, the laws that govern the physical universe, but they do make sense when you consider that this other realm is pure energy, that there is no form as we understand it. There is no space, mm -hmm. there is no time, and therefore there's no distance. So everything in non-locality, and this is perhaps the most confounding, is connected. There's no distance between anything in non-locality. So anything that is uh, changed in non-locality instantly affects everything else in non-locality. So anything that's changed in non-locality that has to do with our physical body is instantaneously changed and is reflected in our physical body. So we are multidimensional beings. And we have yet another step, and I'll stop there because there's a lot to, a lot of ground I'm covering, but we also have a holographic nature. And in the kind of farthest frontier of physics, the discipline that is in that farthest frontier known as M theory, a central tenet of how they view reality is that the information, the template, if you will, for everything that we are familiar with in the physical universe actually exists in this non-local non -local energy realm. And that the physical universe is a holographic projection of the holographic information and energy that exists in non-locality. So as hard as this is to kind of take in, it is for most people and, and even for people who consider themselves to be scientists, it's difficult to take in, but it is a central tenet of M theory. And without it, it's by central, what it means is if you take away this notion of this holographic relationship between non-locality and the local physical universe, their picture of reality just breaks down altogether. You, you can't have M theory without the holographic principle. Mm. So all of these things, if you look at them just purely from the viewpoint of physics, tells us that change could happen in the physical body very rapidly if you change the holographic information, the hologram that is in non-locality. The instant it changes, the physical body changes. And this gives us the big uh, clue, gives us the big uh, aha for how it is possible for Barbara Kuminsky's body to be completely transformed or Anita Morjani to recover from cancer within minutes or even days. But both of those are far faster rates than the more mechanical view modern medicine has of how the, how the body works. What's interesting is that um, you say that often it's... Um belief that has something to do with these changes but that wasn't the case for Anita in fact she believed just the opposite um, it wasn't the case because it was unexpected for Barbara um, and I, I can understand how belief is because I've played with this and I've had things that have certainly changed you know just because I put a lot of attention and belief into it but there's um, a story that Yogananda tells in his autobiography about his sister who was overweight. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember the full story, why she was so unhappy, whether it was affecting her marriage prospects or what, I don't know. But 
he actually changed her body overnight. Right. It wasn't her that changed it. He did it. So how is that possible when someone else is doing it for you? Well, first in that story, I, it's uh, interesting given the West's predilection for beauty being associated with slenderness. She was actually worried about the fact that she was thin. Oh, it was she thin. Wanted to be, she <laughs> wanted to be more, oh, okay. you know, Wrong way round round. and curvy uh, because in that time in India, uh, that was considered more, more beautiful. Yeah. So uh, just a interesting sidelight on how societies value yeah. things. Um, but what Yogananda did was he worked with her for a while and asked her to do very specific yogic practices. And then at some point he was able to say, okay, essentially to her, okay, you're ready. You're ready for this transformation. And with, you know, some degree of uh, humorous interchange between siblings, he said, well, just how big do you want to be? You know, and she said, you know, she threw out something comical. I want to be uh, like you, essentially. She wanted to have the same kind of proportions as her brother. And he said, okay, you will have it. So there were two things operating there. One is she was receptive to him because she already knew that her brother was an extraordinary person uh, spiritually. He knew he, she knew he had worked other healings on other people. So she was ready to believe with his help that she could become this, this uh, more beautiful version of herself. And he was a, in fact a skilled healer because he knew he had to bring her to the point where she was ready to fully believe it, to really completely embrace it. Mm. And so at the right time, he, he said, now it's going to happen. And it did. But that change based on what we believe is echoed in, in many other ways besides uh, that particular case. There's a story that I share in the book about a man named uh, Mr. Wright. Mr. Wright suffered from uh, lymphoma. And as the story begins, he is in a hospital with weeks to live. His doctor, Dr. West, uh, was taking care of him, but pretty much everybody's opinion was that he didn't have much longer to go. But Mr. Wright found a article in a medical journal that said in the very hospital where he was a patient, there was going to be a drug, a chemotherapy drug uh, trialed for lymphoma, his, his particular condition. And he got very excited by this possibility. He was a strong believer in modern medicine, uh, you know, the miracles of modern medicine, so to speak. And he eventually convinced his doctor, Dr. West, to include him in the trial. Now, Dr. West really didn't want to include him because he was too far gone. He didn't really fit the profile of people they wanted in the test, but he couldn't resist him. So he thought, okay, what the heck? And on a Friday afternoon, he was injected with uh, the drug called Cribiazin. And when the doctor came back on Monday, Mr. Wright was up and around. He had had orange-sized tumors visible on his chest. They were gone. His lungs had build, been filled with fluid. That was gone. He was feeling energetic. And within a couple of days, he checked out of the hospital and flew himself home in his own plane because he was a pilot. And seemingly was 100% cure. But alas, Mr. Wright's belief that brought him this cure 
was in the power of cribiazin, in the effectiveness of cribiazin, this particular drug. So after he had been home and functioning again, he read another article in another journal saying that cribiazin had been proven to be ineffective. And he just crashed back within a very, very short of time, short period of time, into the same condition. His tumors reappeared, his lungs filled up with fluid once again. He was back in the hospital and near death. Now, Dr. West was fascinated by this and decided to do something which is probably unethical, but at the time perhaps wasn't as uh, wasn't understood to be unethical. But he just wanted to see what would happen if he told Mr. Wright that there was a new and improved version of cribiazin available. And that even though the old original version had proven uh, ineffective for most people, there was a new version. And that if he was uh, willing, he would give him another injection of it when it arrived at the hospital. So Mr. Wright once again got highly optimistic, full of enthusiasm, and with great, you know, solemnity, Dr. West injected him with the new and improved cribiazin. But this time there wasn't even any drug. This was purely a placebo. Mm -hmm. It was just a saline uh, fluid. But Mr. Wright had the same reaction, which is within two days, all his tumors disappeared. Fluid in the lungs disappeared. Energy came back, checked out of the hospital, and went back home. But alas for Mr. Wright, <laughs> but kind of a cautionary tale for all of us as to the importance of what we believe in. He read yet another article that said cribiazin is no longer being prescribed. It has failed all of its tests and it is known to be utterly ineffective. Mm -hmm. Mr. Wright checked back into the hospital, same symptoms, but this time he died two days later. Yeah. It, you know, so the key there was belief. He believed in this drug. Yes. And when he believed that the drug wasn't working, his illness came back. When he believed it was working, his illness went away. And then once again, when he believed it wasn't working, his illness came back. This was all in his deep conviction that it could cure him. Now, a good friend of mine once said that a lot of people will remark about other people that, gosh, it sure seems like their problem is all in their mind. And he said, well, yeah, but that's the worst place for it to be. Our beliefs are the most powerful thing that uh, influence not only our health, but pretty much everything else in our life as well. Absolutely. So the beliefs are extraordinarily powerful. Yeah, yeah. We're going to take a short break now. Before we do, I must just say, you know, this whole thing about um, telling somebody that this is the new and the improved version, we get it on our TV screens all the time with the laundry right. detergent companies and people believe it. And they go yes. out and buy the new super duper product, don't they? <laughs> yeah. And it may have a real effect on them because they may believe. But does it have an effect on the laundry? That's what I want to know. <laughs> ah, well, that kind of new and improved, that's different. <laughs> Yeah. OK, we're going to take a short break now. You're listening to what is going, going on. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, and my guest today is speaker, teacher, conference presenter, founding member of the Ananda Spiritual Community and author of The Physics of God, Joseph Selby. And we're talking about his latest book, The Physics of Miraculous Healing, how emotion, mind and spirit have unlimited, enable unlimited self-healing. We'll be back with more from Joseph Selby after this break. Stay tuned. Times TV. 
Hello, I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, host of Bomb Times flagship radio show, What is Going On? And as an author, editor and 13 times book judge who's read thousands of books and interviewed hundreds of authors, I'm constantly asked what's really worth reading and what's not. So I created the No BS Spiritual Book Club to help you save time and money by picking the brains of discerning names who have walked this path before you. There's no catch, no fees and no BS, just an ever-growing library of 10 best spiritual book lists from some of your favourite authors and teachers, plus free book excerpts, audios and video interviews with people like Don Miguel Ruiz Jr., David G., Lee Harris, Mark Nepo and more. From well-known classics to hidden gems you've never heard of, it's the only no BS guide to the best spiritual books to enlighten your journey of self-discovery. So why not join the club? Get inspired and save money at the no BS spiritual book club.com. Imagine becoming a super influencer. Reinvent yourself, invest in your brand, and then manifest your success with a robust spheric approach. Own Times Media and Broadcasting offers a unique and multifaceted way to become the spiritual and conscious influencer you deserve to be by putting your message across our powerful platform with its proven record of integrity and excellence. Through our produced shows, Own Times offers the opportunity to become a social media TV personality, a radio show host, an Own Times Magazine columnist, and a syndicated podcaster, all in one shot. By live streaming your show on Ohm Times TV and broadcasting it across the extensive Ohm Times radio and TV networks, you become more than a host. You become an ambassador and a force for positive change. Ohm Times, open yourself to the possibilities. Everything that we do, we can do in a contemplative manner. Through the art of contemplation, you can use the gene keys in a really powerful way. Gene Keys is basically the code book of life. In the Gene Keys, the book is made up of these three levels, shadows, gifts, and cities. And the journey is, from, is through those three levels, kind of unpicking of the shadow states, the releasing of the gifts, and then the embodying of this higher consciousness called the city. And the cities are very exalted words. And it's not like we, we kind of suddenly are all these exalted Christ-like beings but we have flashes and illuminations along the journey. And the more we get stuck into the journey, the more illumination comes to us because the more we're releasing the light from in these codes inside our DNA. So all those revelations are inside us. So the contemplative way is the inner way. There are 16 million children struggling with hunger in America. That's one in five daughters, sons, neighbors, and classmates who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Yet billions of pounds of good food go to waste every year. It's time we do something about it. Feeding America is a nationwide network of food banks that helps provide meals to millions of kids and families in need. Visit feedingamerica.org to help them feed even more. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. Welcome back, Joseph Selby. Of course, um, some really uh, concrete proof of the power of belief, the power of the mind comes through um, studies with people with multiple Yes, it's an extraordinary uh, demonstration of the power of belief because as each personality comes in or departs, the the body essentially that uh, is, is being inhabited by that particular personality will conform to their deeply held beliefs about their appearance, about their general level of health and uh, about their abilities. So extraordinary can that be that there are some uh, personalities who have different eye colors from others. So one, one personality out of, let's say, 10 will have blue eyes while the others will have green. So that's extraordinary. That means that uh, billions upon billions of atoms and molecules 
had to change instantaneously in order for those eyes to change color. It's no small thing. The most extraordinary story I know about the power of multiple personalities to change the body is about a, a German woman who, when she came to get therapy for the multiple personality disorder, was completely blind. But during the course of her therapy, where uh, she was able to you know, open up and accept this concept of her having these different facets of herself, one by one, nine out of 10 of her personalities began to be able to see to varying degrees. Now that's extraordinary enough, but think about the scenario that she's constantly changing personalities. So each personality that has a different level of sight immediately, instantly has that different level of sight when they shift to a new personality. And one of them never did be able to see. One of those 10 personalities was completely blind. And they tested her when she was in this personality with uh, what's called uh, visually evoked potential. You know, they put the usual EEG kind of sensor net on her head and then they shined a really bright light in her eyes. And there was absolutely no activity anywhere in her brain acknowledging that light, including in the visual cortex, which is the back of her brain. But yet the next personality in did react. And the only way this is possible is if billions of neurons changed between those two personalities and within moments they changed. So, so our do you think, sorry, ahead. I was going to say, so if it's belief, were they actually, you know, measuring her brain waves as she changed personality? Because she, in one personality, she's obviously got no belief or knowledge of the other personality. Right. So it's not that she's believing before she switches. So something is triggering, something else is triggering those changes. It's not believing. Well, I think her. in the case of multiple personalities where the, these kind of um, rapid changes are evident, are because each personality has its own convictions about who and what they are and what they can do and what they look like. So those convictions are really a reflect are reflected in their hologram. Taking a step back to the physics we were talking about earlier, when the person, when the personality is holding those beliefs, it shapes their hologram it shapes their subtle energy body and when it shapes it to something different then the physical body immediately reflects that so it's a split second a split second you know when i was studying hypnotherapy and nlp my tutor was used to tell us about people who um you could hypnotize them and tell them that a feather on their arm was a cigarette a lit cigarette right. and they would end up with a burn and somebody um, who wanted their eyesight to be improved he took them back to a time when their eyesight was good brought them forward in time with that eyesight and that remained uh-huh yeah there are ways to change people's beliefs there are uh i think more importantly ways that we can change our own beliefs not that I'm saying you shouldn't go to healers, shouldn't go to people who can help you, but you are your biggest helper. You are the one who has developed the current set of beliefs that you have, and you can methodically and deliberately change those beliefs by embracing various techniques, by embracing affirmations, by embracing meditation, where you experientially 
And that's the key with the regression is he took her back or him back, I'm not sure which was there in your story, to a time when that person believed that their sight was good. And so they were experiencing that and then that experience was brought forward, that belief and experience go together. So the best way to change belief is to experience the things we want to believe. And that will automatically change our convictions. So meditating, uh, you know, a lot of people say, well, meditating, yeah, I hear it, you know, will make you feel more relaxed or calmer. But really, meditation is a methodical doorway for you to uh, experience and influence any aspect of yourself from emotions to beliefs to your conviction about who, who you are, uh, whether you're a soul or a physical being, all of those direct experiences that you open up to with meditation can change your beliefs. And that's why in the long run, meditation is so powerful. Well, you know, I have um, practiced some of this and I have created um, an incredible healing of an injury. Um, what I can't do, as much as I would like to, is, you know, kind of be 35 again. <laughs> so I don't well, know as do I put it one. to some people, you know, some beliefs you hold more deeply, more yeah. inchoately than others. They really came in when you were born uh, and they were reinforced for every moment of the rest of your life. And it is theoretically possible to change those kinds of beliefs. But if you just are practical about how much time you have and how much will you have and um, what and really examine what would help you the most in your life. Being 35 may not be that, right? Being mm -hmm. happy, being healthy, being uh, emotionally harmonious. Now, those things are worth changing because they stay with you whether you're five or 95. Yeah. So those things are possible, but I don't really recommend that you set your mind on trying to do those, knowing they're possible should give you encouragement to think you can do the other. But focus on what you can what you can reach. I think that sometimes we can believe that others can do it, but we don't believe we can do it. And that's a belief really worth working on. Yes. And we generally do it incrementally. I mean, near-death experience can uh, create profound change in the way people view reality and themselves. But unless when you meditate, you can completely leave the body and experience the astral regions in the heavens, you're unlikely to be able to engineer that same level, that same dramatic amount of change. So what I say to people is, is accept that it's going to be incremental, but be methodical about it, be deliberate about it, mm -hmm. that you really can change it over time. I've meditated for 50 years and it's given me a very uh, encouraging perspective on how much change can actually come to me over uh, the years that is, is born of direct experience of spirit, is born of uh, connecting to deeper beliefs or experiencing more harmonious uh, emotions. But all of it took time and what you, about emotion? Be realistic in your expectations. Yeah. What about emotion? Um, you know, because we we hear over and over again that in manifesting, emotion is very important. You know, the saying thoughts are electric, 
emotions are magnetic. You've got to have the emotion in order to attract. How important is emotion in beliefs? I would say that your beliefs support your emotions. Some emotional experience probably can create beliefs. So there's an interchange going on between the two. But I would say the most important thing in terms of health about your emotions is to recognize that staying in positive, you know, pleasant, harmonious, energized emotions can do more to make you healthy than just about any other thing except belief because your emotions are essentially movements of life force. So when you have a, you know, you, we, we notice our emotions mostly when they change, right? We'll suddenly feel, oh, you know, a burst of happiness or something will strike us to change how we're feeling. And at that moment, we'll notice the movement. We'll notice, we'll notice that something else is uh, flowing in our body. Because it actually really is. Our life force is flowing. But it's flowing in our hologram. It's flowing in our energy body. And when that moves in certain ways within our energy body, what we feel in our physical body is a sense of expansion or contraction, a rise or a descent. And those, those four general experiences combine into what we then later define as, you know, well, I felt threatened or I felt safe or I felt I, you know, on top of the world or I felt I was in the dumps, you know, all of these ways in which we describe those, we're really describing the way that movement of subtle energy of life force in the body makes us feel. So when it moves, it also affects the life processes that are going on in every cell in the body. So when we have negative emotions, they actually get in the way of the uh, life processes that should be happening to keep us healthy. And if we hold a negative emotion habitually for long periods of time, and these different emotions tend to move in the same place, they might be in the heart, they might be in the stomach, and we might feel them in the lower back. You know, we, we feel our emotions everywhere, not just the heart. But if they're constantly occurring in a particular part of the body, like if we feel constricted by our life, we're, you know, we might feel it in our lungs as much as we feel it in our heart. And if we're feeling it in our lungs, then over time, because we're introducing a literally a discordant vibration mm. into that part of our body, it prevents our cells from being efficient makers of proteins, of uh, eliminating things from our cells that they need to get rid of, bringing in uh, fresh matter that they need to build new proteins. And eventually they will break down. And that breaking down is what we notice as cancer or diabetes or hypertension or any number of uh, illnesses that you can name. They all begin with what to medicine is the mysterious breakdown of cellular functions. But to a metaphysician, to a, a spiritual doctor who could and often do see your emotions, there's no mystery at all. They can see that your emotions are, you know, coming up the works. They are preventing 
mm-hmm. your body from uh, its its optimum behavior. So we're looking. I'm looking at it. I'm sharing it with you from the perspective of negative emotions. Yeah. But positive emotions are even more important. It, the the key to health is really to have harmonious, upward moving, relaxing emotions, because then they allow your body's life processes to be optimized and everything functions well. Uh, In uh, his book, Bernie Siegel's book, Love, Medicine and Miracles, one of Mm. my all-time favorite books, he says quite simply, happy people don't get sick. Yeah, yeah, ain't that the truth? So, I mean, you may get you may get a cold, you may have this and that, but the number of people who are truly happy who get uh, serious illnesses is, is is really rare, really few. Mm. So, meditation is a central theme in all of your books. Um, what it is, you know, how to do it, uh, all the benefits of it. Um, You've taught it for many years, you've practiced it for many years, but there are people who find it, no matter how many times they try, they find it very hard to do. But you have a methodical process that you use and you teach people. Could you share that with us? Sure. Well, first, what I always recommend to people is use a technique. I teach a technique called Hong Sa, which comes from the the path that I'm on of Yogananda's teachings. But it's by far, in a way, not the only technique you can you can use. But the reason I recommend a technique is that it's it's hard to get your mind to slow down and to get your physical body to sit still, so that you can have the kind of pleasant experiences and even extraordinary experiences that are possible in meditation. So a technique is really helpful. Uh, I won't try to teach it in the time we have, but you can find it uh, on my website. You can find it in all my books. Or if you already have a technique that you know, uh, include that in what you are trying to do. But the, the next thing I try to tell people is realize that you are, your life is already full of habits. And those habits have been uh, strengthened and supported by neural circuits that have actually formed in your brain that will automatically trigger when anything associated to that particular habit either comes into your mind as a thought or somebody's comment or the time of day, whatever, there are many, many triggers. So we tend to eat lunch at the same time because we're triggered to eat lunch at the same time. Our, our you know, digestive juices start flowing, et cetera, et cetera. And this is a good thing. Many habits are good things. But you have to be realistic about the fact that if you want to meditate, say, in the morning or in the evening, or before you go to bed, you already have habits that occupy those time slots, if you will. And that with an initial burst of enthusiasm, you may succeed in meditating five mornings in a row or two weeks in a row. But if you kind of let down your guard and relax your will, those habits that have been there all along will start to reassert themselves. And they often feel really good. It's like coming back and spending time with an old friend, right? Oh, I forgot how much I liked, you know, having my toast at this time of the day, whatever it is. So just realize that establishing a meditation habit is going to require determination, but Be as methodical about using that determination as you can. Figure out what time in the day you actually are going to do it. What are you competing with? So if you you do have something you normally do at that time, are you going to shift it to another time? Are you going to modify it? Are you going to shorten it? Are you going to get up earlier? Whatever it is, realize that you've got to make a space in your life for this to happen over and over and over. Mm. Also realize that 
if you stick with it for weeks to months, you're also going to create a neural circuit that supports meditation. I liken it to uh, beginning to meditate is like starting on a bicycle, riding up to the top of a plateau. You, you have to work at it. But when you get to the plateau, it's much easier going. So yeah. the first weeks, first months, perhaps, of establishing a meditation habit will take some effort. But once you establish the habit, then it's far more easy to meditate regularly. Yeah. So just think with it and don't expect that you're instantly going to be able to sit still and control your thoughts. It's kind of yeah. like if you take up tennis, you're, you're not going to play like Rafa and Adal. I'm going to have to interrupt you, Joseph, because we really are almost out of time. Um, so I want to say thank you for joining us today. Thank you for this book. It truly is. Um, you know, it, it really did an awful lot for me. And I'm sure it will do a lot for others who read it too. So thank you. Thank you. So The Physics of Miraculous Healing, How Emotion, Mind and Spirit Enable Unlimited Self-Healing by Joseph Selby is published by TriStream, an imprint of Protectors Press and is available in paperback, Kindle and Audible audiobook. So for more information about Joseph's books, his events, articles and resources for meditation, you can visit his website, Joseph Selby, S-E-L-B-I-E dot -E com. That brings us to the end of this week's show. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer. I'll be back at the same time next week with another edition of What Is Going On. Till then, it's goodbye from me. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you.